is Joan Lippincott, Associate Executive Director Emerita from CNI, and I'm so delighted to have you joining us for a CNI Spring Membership Meeting webinar on sensitive and protected data in distributed digital preservation networks, an IMLS planning grant brief. This is a really important topic for many libraries and for many universities, and we're delighted to have this collaborative project represented in our lineup of sessions. This project includes uh, speakers from the partner organizations, and they are Courtney Muma and Christy Park of the Texas Digital Library and Sybil Schaefer of the UC San Diego uh, Library. So um, today we're going to have all of the participants' microphones muted, but as um, the presenters go through the presentation, please feel free to write in your questions or comments into the Q&A. So we can use the chat um, box as well, but we're primarily going to be looking to the Q&A, um, which you'll see in an icon on your screen and you can type in a question at any time. I'll be monitoring that box and we'll be feeding the presenters your questions at the end of the half hour presentation. Um, we're going to be putting any additional information into the chat if something comes up like a URL. Um, we will be sharing the URL for the slides when they're available, and this uh, session will be recorded and you'll have access to the recording uh, after this session. So I um, think that should get us going, and so I'm going to hand the session over to the panelists and uh, mute myself and over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Joan, and thanks to everybody who is attending for uh, taking time out to hear an update from us about sensitive and pro protected data and distributed digital preservation networks. My name is Christy Park, and I'm the executive director of the Texas Digital Library, one of the partners on this project. I'm joined by Sybil Schaefer, who is the Digital Preservation Analyst for Research Data Curation at UC San Diego Library and the Chronopolis Program Manager, and by Courtney Muma, my colleague, who's the Deputy Director of the Texas Digital Library. TDL and uh, UC San Diego Library have partnered on this project, which was funded through an IMLS planning grant to explore a nationwide model for a DDP service that would close gaps in current preservation offerings for sensitive and protected data. Our briefing today will give an overview of that investigation to date, describing the problem we're trying to solve and our activities up to this point, including some use cases that we've gathered and analysis of the legal agreements governing such a service as well as necessary elements we've identified for a DDP network for private and sensitive data. TDL and UCSD have um, both established business models for uh, building and providing distributed digital preservation services, as well as a history of collaborating with one another on services like these. UCSD Library, of course, manages Chronopolis, which is an internationally recognized DDP service that spans three sites across the US and is one of the earliest established distributed digital preservation services in the world, having been in operation now for more than a dozen years. TDL, which is a consortium of academic libraries providing a number of services supporting digital library work, has offered access to distributed digital preservation storage since 2015 using its own hosted instance of DuraCloud. Our history with UCSD goes back to uh, work that we did together on the Deepin project, but in 2017, TDL also joined the Chronopolis network in order to provide access to Chronopolis storage for our members and to become a replicating node for that network. We do that using storage at the Texas Advanced Computing Center. So we've been excited 
to be able to continue our collaboration and advancement across these two institutions, the advancement of distributed digital preservation services beyond the wind down of DEPIN. Beyond the main project partners and our funder, the Institute for Museum and Library Services, we've been grateful for the support and participation of a large number of institutions who've partnered with us on this project. And I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about them. One of the reasons that we decided to work on this project in particular, uh, beyond the identification of the need for such a thing, is that both TDL and UCSD maintain close working relationships with organizations affiliated with their campuses that could provide key resources for a DDP service for uh, private and sensitive data. The Texas Advanced Computing Center, or TAC, at UT Austin has partnered with TDL on a number of projects and we currently use storage um, at TAC for our uh, Chronopolis node. TAC independently offers secure HIPAA and FERPA compliant storage to local partners. And similarly, the San Diego Supercomputing Center at, at UCSD uh, provides HIPAA compliant storage to faculty and researchers there. Both computing centers have shared with us their expertise in providing sensitive data solutions, including service and cost modeling. But we also, you know, I think at the back of our minds would hope that any service we can build would take it, take full use of the resources available to us through these two um, institutions. Additionally, throughout the project, we've benefited from consultation with a large number of representatives, including uh, rep representatives from the AP Trust, the Smithsonian Institute, Northeastern University, UNT Health Science Center, UT Southwestern Medical Center, and the Dell Medical School at UT Austin, DuraCloud at its home institution, Lyricis, and the Maryland Advanced Research Computing Center at Johns Hopkins. These partners have, among other things, helped us build use cases for a private and sensitive data distributed storage network and helped surface needs and challenges related to such a service. And we have also partnered with Security Metrics, which uh, is a expert consulting for, firm in HIPAA compliance to provide templates for policy creation and to review various legal agreements for us um, and the final project deliverables. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Sybil to uh, start digging into the project itself. Hey, everyone. Um, so for those of you who are not familiar with the term distributed digital preservation, I'd like to take this opportunity to define it since we'll be referring to it throughout the uh, presentation. Um, in 2010, the Meta Archive Cooperative published a guide to distributed digital preservation and offered this definition. Distributed digital preservation methodologies hold that any responsible preservation system must distribute copies of digital files to geographically dispersed locations. It also must preserve, not merely back up, the files in these different locations. And this guide from Meta Archive also provides some qualities of the different sites um, that should also be in place, such as that sites preserving the same content should be within a 75 to 125 mile radius of one another. They should be distributed beyond the typical pathways of natural disasters such as hurricanes, earthquakes, typhoons, tornadoes. They should be distributed across different power grids. Um, and they should be under the control of different system administrators. This is one that I feel is often overlooked uh, but for security purposes, all the preservation copies should not be accessible by one person or team of people. And control and monitoring of each preservation site should ideally be handled locally by that site to ensure that the network's contents aren't subject to uh, one point of human-based failure. The content preserved in the disparate sites should be on live media and checked regularly for um, bit rot and other issues. They should be, the content should be replicated at least three times. And then lastly, regardless of whatever technical infrastructure a DDP network adopts, the network is going to perform three main tasks, content, 
ingest or harvest, content monitoring and content retrieval with each of these varying across different technical infrastructures. So the problem that we're trying to tackle with this grant is that although distributed digital preservation services have been offered in the United States for well over a decade, there isn't a distributed service offering for sensitive data. And we propose that personally identifiable information or PII and uh, personal, personal health information, PHI, as well as other sensitive data that's in the custody of libraries, uh, academic health science centers and archives is at an escalated risk of loss because of the, uh, the lack of service for this. Um, it's also normal practice for archives to refuse any data that contains any uh, PHI or PII, regardless of its historical or evidential value, simply because they don't have the means to steward it. Um, so as part of this work, this team is assuming that the bar set by HIPAA is sufficiently high to protect many other kinds of non-regulated sensitive data. And based on that bar, what we're really looking at is what it takes to provide a HIPAA compliant DDP network. So one of the goals of this grant is to investigate the capacity and feasibility of a nationwide model for a DDP service that would close this gap for sensitive data. Um, the technology infrastructure and expertise needed to build a DDP service for sensitive data exists. Uh, Christy's already mentioned our partners and the expertise that they have, so that part is there. Uh, but the connections, agreements, and processes to pull it together to form a viable service are lacking. Um, so we're really trying to not necessarily build the service yet, but actually set the groundwork for it and plan out what we need for it. Um, we're also interested in using the grant develop deliverables to really assess our capacity to meet the requirements that we outline and to initiate discussions with possible network partners. So we started the grant in September of last year. One of the first steps we took was to hire Hassam Andalib, our GRA. Uh, we started gathering data at that point, conducting interviews for use cases and outlining the agreements that we currently have between institutions. We had a very successful in-person partner meeting in Austin in December, and we're now drafting um, our final report and working with security metrics, the uh, HIPAA compliance experts that Christy mentioned, uh, to determine how our current slate of agreements and technical infrastructure would need to be changed in order to be HIPAA compliant. Once we have solid drafts of the report and legal templates, we're planning to disseminate those to our project participants and have a second meeting, this time virtually, to gather feedback um, and we'll start to finalize the report based on that feedback and then eventually publish the report and any agreement templates and cost modeling that we've developed. So as we've progressed through this grant, we've identified a couple of different potential outcomes. Um, the first is the one that we kind of assumed we would end up with, and that is a roadmap and recommendations for a DDP solution for this private and sensitive data, uh, ideally new technological and community partnerships. And uh, the potential of further grant projects or grants is definitely something that we've been discussing. Um, and an alternative outcome is the conclusion that the DD, well, it's not alternative, it could be done in conjunction with, but is the conclusion that a DDP for private and sensitive data is not feasible at this time. And some of the barriers that we've actually um, come across as we've done our research is the lack of user readiness, cost, or technological complexity. And I can say that the lack of user readiness and cost are probably the more serious barriers um, compared to technological complexity. And with that, I am going to turn it over to Courtney to talk about um, some of the use cases that we have uncovered. Thank you, Sybil and Christy. Um, so, um, oops, sorry, I've lost my, there we go. So 
so far we have collected use cases about private and sensitive data content that should be preserved in a distributed network from several medical libraries, as well as archives and special collections. So far, um, those that we've documented contain various sensitive materials, including human rights records, first person accounts of trauma, um, and commercial, commercially restricted data, and also email. In each of these use case discussions, we typically ask whether institutions know they have sensitive data that justifies a high level of preservation. In some cases, we think that institutions suspect that there is, but haven't done the level of assessment or appraisal necessary to quantify the problem sufficiently, as Sybil alluded to earlier. Alternately, in other cases, the assessment of sensitive content has been done and a decision has been explicitly made not to bring it into the custody of the library or archives. Use cases that have demonstrated this behavior give one or more of the following reasons as examples. Um, limited resources to manage it, unclear authority to manage it properly, and a dearth of a place to put it. So this illustration shows the legal binds that are necessary to sustain the Chronopolis digital, digital preservation um, system. As you can see, there are many connections here which require legal agreements. The connections you see include software licenses, so for example, those which are in place for DuraCloud, Chronopolis, and AWS. They also include contracts, service level agreements, and MOUs between service providers and storage nodes, so like those that TDL has with TAC and Chronopolis has with NCAR. Um, it, it has some agreements between the service provider and depositor, like UCSD and TDL do with their members and their community depositors. And then between two service providers, like those agreements that exist between Chronopolis and TDL, as well as between Lyricist, DuraCloud, and Chronopolis. So the project team recognizes that the complexity of this system creates a barrier to the formation of a DDP network for sensitive data, but there are others. So besides the complexity of our current technological infrastructure and the legal entanglements, we face other barriers to creating a DDP for sensitive data. Clearly, we need to align and enhance our agreements, and we especially need to make sure we have all of the necessary business associate agreements or BAAs in place. Additionally, with sensitive data, there's always a liability concern and the assignment of liability can be perplexing with so many stakeholders. Just to name a few, there are depositors, donors, preservation staff, like the repository managers, archivists, developers, and service providers. There are the people in the data. Um, there are communities represented by the data. And there are also the original creators, the doctor, the researcher, et cetera. And then finally, there are the administrators, like the academic deans and presidents for overall support and approval, the university CIO, the university librarian, I could go on. As archivists and librarians, we are data custodians who decide how and when the owner's decisions are applied based on classification and regulations. But without knowing who owns the data, it can be hard to make good decisions about digital preservation. And how do we properly identify who is the data owner because that determination will then guide policy about who can manipulate, control, and ultimately destroy sensitive content. Our HIPAA consultants on the grant contributed to us that in the US ownership of data is largely, but not entirely, driven by commerce. And they also gave the example to us that in the EU, alternately, it is generally driven by privacy. So for these issues and other reasons I mentioned when discussing our use cases, many institutions are simply not ready for a DDP option for their sensitive data. But once they are ready, we still have a high bar to meet for appropriate service governance. Our assembled guest at our in-person meeting at the end of last year had clear recommendations that governance decisions be collaborative, but grounded in centralized decision making. They asked for diverse representation of institutional types, practitioners, and storage node partners, and that our vision, roles, and responsibilities be clear. They asked that any network be data and standards driven, as well as responsive to legal fluctuation and jurisdictional differences, and that the data owner maintain control of their data. Our partners at the meeting, many of whom were well acquainted with the failure of the Digital Preservation Network, or DPEN, 
emphasize transparent financial reporting, a good succession plan, and open communication at all levels. This illustrates the very basic configuration and requirements of a HIPAA compliant DDP network. Currently, uh, SDSC, the San Diego Supercomputing Center and TAC are the only compliant nodes we've identified. So we're already at a bit of a disadvantage in terms of being able to form a DDP network with a minimum of three distributed nodes. We are working to overlay our existing DDP network infrastructure with the needs of this much more simplified one and identify the requirements to accommodate a subset of sensitive data without disrupting the regular service or undermining compliance to HIPAA as the gold standard. We are also open to modeling a mostly HIPAA compliant without the expensive audit model because we've found that so many of our partners aren't actually accepting real HIPAA or FERPA data into their collections. For that use case, we'll redefine HIPAA's covered entity and business associate for our own purposes. The team will continue our work through September this year, intermittently gathering use cases where they pop up and that's a call. So please reach out to us if any of you have one that you'd like to contribute. Um, we're working on our service model, as I mentioned, which has included looking at gaps between our technical infrastructure in our current systems and the requirements of a sensitive data network. Additionally, this summer, we'll be drafting those templates of the agreements that need to be in place, as well as gather as much information as possible about costs. And as Sybil mentioned, we're already on that. Our final report will recommend next steps and outline the work that still needs to be done to achieve a successful DDP option for sensitive data. And as I mentioned before, we've only identified two potential nodes. So we'd like some feedback if you'd like to participate. Um, if a willing node doesn't already exist, we would need significant seed funding toward HIPAA compliance activities leading to that third node being generated. So um, that concludes today's briefing. I want to thank all of our partners, as you saw on that slide that Christy presented, who have participated so far with us and continue to do so. Um, please do, again, reach out to us if you'd like to be involved in the final months of our work. You can find all of our project documentation so far on our wiki for the project which contains use cases, DDP documentation and agreements, as well as all of our notes from our in-person meeting late last year. Um, finally, I wanna thank CNI for your work transitioning the conference to all virtual. We know it must've been a big challenge. So now Sybil, Christy and I welcome your questions. Thank you so much. I know I learned a lot from this presentation. i had been thinking mostly of health sciences data, but um, things like sensitive data from political movements and those kinds of things uh, are also certainly the kinds of materials that uh, archives in universities may be collecting now. Uh, we have one question so far. Um, it's from Ray, and I apologize if I mispronounce the last name, Unshin. Um, and the question is, does the scope of this project include sensitive and private faculty research data, for example, faculty DOD research data, other sensitive national grant funded faculty research, such as funded from NSF or N NIH? Are there thoughts toward the size of data sets for this type of repository and thoughts towards the frequency of upload, download, retrieval? Are these envisioned as dark archives or can they be frequently accessed by specified or approved users? Any recommendations towards these areas? Will, will some of this be included in your report? I can read uh, any of that or you can take a look at the Q&A. Um, who would like to, to well, respond? I can pop in. There were a series of questions there and I could pop in about the access part. That's probably the easiest question to answer because the way the Chronopolis uh, network is set up now is that it is a dark archive um, across all of the three sites. Uh, only system administrators are actually allowed to access data. Um, so there is very limited access to the data. Um, and actually I'm trying to recall the other questions now. Uh, we could prompt, that would be great. Would, would someone be able, 
so it's a dark archive, but would a researcher who's been given permission be able to go in and out retrieving different parts of the data set or performing different queries? They could definitely request, uh, make requests for data uh, retrieval, yes. Queries, um, not so much. It's more, it's not really a working area. It's when the data is finalized, uh, it is preserved in the different notes. Ray, I hope that answered your questions. Um, if not, maybe you'd type up something additional in the Q and A. Um, there were another uh, additional questions within yes. that particular question. So, well, this is Christy. The other questions were around: uh, Have have we thought about scale, size of data sets? Yes. And uh, would we take in faculty research data? I think the answer to the to whether we would take in research data is potentially yes. Um, do do you or Courtney have thoughts about scale? Um, I'll take both actually. So the first question about the research data, I agree potentially yes. Um, but I think with the caveat of what Sybil, Sybil mentioned about this being the, the dark archive. Um, and um, now I'm forgetting the second one. <laughs> Large data sets. Large data sets. Right. I think, so, yeah, go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, in, in terms of um, data size, you know, I think that um, we, we've all worked with these large computing centers for so long that um, we know the answers to that question are like, well, we can do whatever you need to do if you have enough money. <laughs> so I yeah. think that's essentially what we're facing. Would you agree, Sybil? Yeah, and I think different people have different ideas of what constitutes a large data set. Um, I know in my mind, uh, like one terabyte is not large, but I know in other people's mind it is. Whereas one petabyte, I would, I would consider that on the large size side. Yeah, and we see that too at at TDL. We see that the vast difference in what people are actually talking about when they're saying large or big data. Yeah, and the other thing that I wanted to get back to because there was the Department of Defense data mentioned, and I just did want to say that one thing that we haven't looked at in this grant is um, classified uh, data. And I think that that would probably follow, that would probably require um, additional uh, considerations. Yeah, I think that's right. I don't know if that could fall under that bar that we've created at the HIPAA and FERPA level. Yeah. Well, to follow up, David Millman has a question on uh, asking you to, uh, Courtney, to address a little bit more about what HIPAA without audit means. Is that not then HIPAA compliant? Well, what I meant by that is uh, the HIPAA compliance audits are extremely expensive, and we have the advantage of UCSD um, and uh, or sorry, the San Diego Supercomputing Center and the Texas Advanced Computing Center already having undergone those expensive giant audits. Um, and so as two of our nodes, that's awfully convenient and it cuts costs. So if we were to add a third node, there would be a much higher cost to get us to HIPAA, HIPAA compliance. Mm -hmm. So all that to say, what we have discovered in our use cases is that there is very little actual HIPAA and FERPA content being held in the custody of the libraries and archives that we have spoken with um, and the use cases that we have collected. And so um, what I meant by that is a HIPAA-like without the actual expensive audit. So as close as we can get to it, renaming some of the essential elements in the HIPAA compliant um, nodes, but without actually going through the rigmarole and the cost of the actual audit. Thank you. And we have time for one last question, which is from Tim McGeary. He asked, how are you addressing privacy of data? For example, data may have been collected from users who may not have considered data storage in such a manner. As you know, privacy policies have changed substantially over the years. So perhaps he's thinking of 
uh, you know, historical data that archives might want to acquire from a researcher or something along those lines. Anyone like to address that? So I can start too, and, and Courtney and Sybil can chime in. I think that one of the ways to answer that is by reiterating that what we're finding is that there is a lot of that kind of data, historical data, where there might be uh, private and sensitive information in it, in archives, for instance, and that our potential users uh, suspect that's the case, but they have not done the assessment or full assessment to know if that's the case. And so I think it is definitely uh, a concern and it's part of that challenge of readiness that we're encountering um, kind of left and right with this. Thank you. And We've reached our time, and so I want to thank Courtney, Christy, and Sybil for giving us a really excellent presentation and some really clear answers to the questions. And I thank all of the participants for taking the time out of your crazy days that we're experiencing right now um, to come together and discuss some really important themes um, for our CNI community. So thank you very much and um, take care everyone, stay healthy. Mm -hmm.